Conference quarterfinal. Hello, everybody. Thank you, TJ, and thank you, Frodan. I am Nathan. That's Admiral Zamora, joined by James Firebat Costasic. And much to, uh, I think, not to my surprise at least, Priest did not get the job done. But the yeah. Cthulhu Warriors are a really tough matchup. But coming up this one, Chess Dude versus Neo Ability. We have a mirror match in terms of lineup. Uh, but a little bit of different approaches to this one. You take a look at the bands that have been set out here. Talk to me about what's happening in this match. Well, it looks like Neobility has gone with the Shaman ban, which is a little bit more traditional in mirror matches. You just kind of want to ban the deck that's the highest win rate overall. Get that out of the way, and then thus the sum of your lineup's win rate gets higher than your opponent's. And then we have Chess Dude going with a little bit of an interesting approach, banning out the Warrior, which means maybe his lineup isn't tailored to deal that great with Warrior. We do see he's got a Hunter there, and so it's not really the the one that's uh, mid rangey He's probably got the Secret Hunter or some sort of archetype thereof that uh, makes it so kind of Warrior becomes a problem deck for him. Right, and when Warrior's a problem deck for you, that is a, obviously a big talking point. Warrior has kind of been at the forefront of the metagame for a very long time now. It's not a surprise to see it banned, uh, but banning Shaman, we've seen so many changes with it recently. Is the mid-range Shaman really the one that deserves that ban where there's just nothing you can do against it? Yeah, I personally favor the when you just ban out mid-range Shaman. If you look at just ladder statistics, which is the largest sample size at the moment for statistics, it's going to come up showing that, you know, the mid-range Shaman deck is the most prominent. It's got one of the highest win rates in the game, and you just get that out of the way. So I favor that. But going into this matchup, Chess Dude playing his Hunter deck, Neability on the Druid deck. A lot of players are kind of in debates of whether, you know, the Hunter's got a favorable matchup or the Druid has a favorable matchup. A lot of times on ladder, you'll see that the stats reflect that the Hunter has a favorable matchup. But this Hunter deck's a little bit weird. It's not really the same sort of thing, and it, it kind of merited the Warrior ban. It, it's not a deck list that you'll typically see on ladder. Yeah, I mean, the Knife Juggler or Leash the Hounds is something we've seen jump in from time to time. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this one's doing a much heavier early scaling, yeah. and its end game is two Savannah High Main, one Ragnaros, one Call of the Wild. Yeah, only one. Right. Yeah, that's that's crazy. And one so. Argent Horse Rider, one Deadly Shot. And of course, the Deadly Shot. Uh, this is one of the matchups where it typically can be a big deal. But Neo Ability's playing pretty much a strict token Malagos build. There are yeah. no Ancients of War. There are no large taunts. Mm -hmm. Deadly Shot, still very powerful in this matchup, still very important. Not quite to the same degree as it is when your opponent's running Ancient of War. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's really only, you know, Malagos, Rag, or Arcane Giants to be able to hit with the Deadly Shot. And most of the time, aside from Ragnaros, all of those things are going to come down either with other things or when you're getting killed. So it's uh, maybe hard to find too much value out of the card, but... Typically speaking, tempo-oriented decks perform quite well against Druid because Druid can fall off in the mid-game where they don't have too many solid creatures and can get kind of boxed out by uh, some more aggressive tempo lines of play. But New Ability is not having that issue right now as he was able to, you know, get the one drop where the where Chess Dude was able to fall short on the one drop. So actually quite ahead on board. Yeah, and this is one of those situations where Druid can really thrive is when it has that step up the entire way and can kind of skip a step with Meyer Keeper in a lot of situations. You know, you talked about kind of falling off in the mid game as well. That's part of the problem with playing some of the combo oriented versions is eventually he needs to find a way to combo things. Uh, against Hunter, if you're kind of just putting together pieces, eventually a Houndmaster is going to land. Yeah. Eventually Savannah Highmane is going to be there. Those are situations where the Druid can start to lose the game if they don't have a lot of pressure at that point. And the ability is going to be afraid of you know, Houndmasters at all stages of the game because he is aware of the deck list and he is aware that, you know, Chess Dude has, runs like tons of extra beasts. You see double Infested Wolf and double Houndmaster in there just to try and guarantee that, you know, he can land Houndmaster as often as possible and get those tempo swings to just put pressure, pressure, pressure. And how much does the Knife Juggler Unleash the Hounds also affect the matchup versus Neo Ability, who's relying a lot on Violet Teacher to pull a lot of that heavy lifting? Uh, it can be kind of influential. It's very influential if you get those kind of Violet Teacher boards where it's just the Violet Teacher and a bunch of 1-1s. One -ones. But uh, I, I believe Neo Ability is going to be conscious of that fact and just always combo that with Power of the Wild, and then it's a lot less impactful. Like, sure, it can clean up some, but if you spend five mana to clean up what your opponent spent five or six mana doing, then at the end of the day, you're behind. Right. That one Power of the Wild, that is the only copy in Neobility's deck. Other copies would require to show up through Raven Idol. 
And this board, it's pretty darn significant for Chess Dude. I know it doesn't look like much, but landing a Houndmaster is one of the devastating plays that Hunter can make. And landing, landing a Houndmaster to protect a Leoc for future turns, to combo with your Unleash, too. It's all starting to come together for Chess Dude here. He's got definitely some lines that will lead into some very powerful turns in the future. Yeah, this is probably the most critical turn of the game for Chess Dude mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah, any, any time you can slam a Houndmaster on curve and get value off of it is absolutely huge. I don't have the exact stats on me right now, but at one point when Midrange Hunter was very dominant in the metagame, there were people that ran the stats on it and it increased its win rate by like 20% or something like wow. that. So it, it's just absolutely huge that you land your Houndmaster on curve on turn four, and that's why, you know, a lot of people play extra early game beasts. It's very akin to the Tusker Totemic Totem Golem dynamic. Yeah, well, it, it's it, <laughs> extra it has stats. the same like sort of effect as that, right. but it, it's not RNG based. It's right. positional that, based. That's what I meant. Yeah. The, the effect of it. Just it's such a massive swing to the board right here with Leoc. He's added seven power to the board and five health to the board mm -hmm. for four mana. That it's, is that is tremendous. Yeah, it's very powerful, and he takes a risk here going face. Going face plays into mulch very, very, very heavily, whereas normally it doesn't really have too many great targets aside from Ragnaros in your deck. So you can potentially get kind of swung out of the game here by a mulch, but Chess Dude feels like he needs the damage, doesn't feel like his hand has been as dominant. So new ability also only runs one copy of it, so the odds of him having mulch at this stage of the game is... Uh, Fairly low, but still pretty risky. It's certainly not a card that Neobility is going to opt to hang on to yeah, in right the early now. stage. So now Chess Dude can kind of mark down, you know, take a mental note in his head that there is no mulch in Neobility's hand if this Leak doesn't get mulched, because it would get mulched 100% of the time, regardless of what other cards are in Neobility's hand. Right. There, I mean, there's no better mulch target than this. Savannah Highmane leaves something behind, so unless he had board presence leading into a turn like that. This is about as good as the mulch gets. Swipe is pretty darn good, though. Yeah, it's not bad. And Chess Dude played around the more likely outcome of Swipe by going face in this situation with the Leoc, because the trades would have happened with the Leoc either way. Wow. Neobility pushes damage with the Mire Keeper instead of eliminating the Soundmaster. That is a very aggressive move. Yeah, it's, it's super aggressive. He could have potentially full cleared there and but instead he's just going to be like, it's not a beast, you got to trade with me. Yeah, I kind of like this because he's got Azure Drake and Moonfire to follow up. Mm -hmm. If Chess Dude opts into this race with Neobility, then the Neobility has kind of a miniature swing turn with this. Yeah, and even if Bow comes out, you expect uh, there's not going to be too strong of a minion attached to Bow. Potentially no two drop at all behind Bow because there isn't that many two drops in the, the current Hunter builds. And then uh, you can just counter back with Azure Drake Moonfire and pull ahead because a 4 4 doesn't die to the 3 1 Eagle Horn Bow that you're expecting to be developed. And now that you see this play, though, if you're in the ability spot, I feel like this wasn't quite the board state he envisioned no. coming into this turn. Is he feeling, and look at this look on his face, is he feeling like maybe this backfired just a little bit? Yeah, if there was no two drop, it works out flawlessly. But if there's a Kindly Grandmother or a Knife Juggler coming down, then those are two great. You know, two mana, one damage ways that Chess Dude can uh, make the Eagle Horn Bow trade with the Drake. But he is pushing a lot of damage still. If uh, Chess Dude has to face tank the Drake, you know, he's dropping down to 15. There might be some play to that. There yeah, might I'm, be. I'm curious if this is a spot where Chess Dude can ever. Well, oh. okay, that, that, okay, that's a game changer. You're definitely playing Savannah High Main <laughs> on six against Druid. No! Yeah. No! Even if. Uh, if the juggle misses, you have to give up your knife juggler, but that's not a big deal. Like, it, it obviously, it would be worse for you, but... That's a critical juggle yeah. as well. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's... Now he's really pulling ahead. Chess Dude has this board almost on lockdown. And now look at Neobility. The, the stress just set into Neobility. Like, yeah. that is the last thing I needed. Malagos, I think, is a pretty significant draw, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I mean, I feel like the hope at this point for Neobility is very much limited in Mal and innervate Malagos and hope that this succeeds. Yeah, I think that I think you're right. I think that is his only real line of play in this situation. Everything else is just too weak. Savannah High Main is just too much of a beast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this play, I, I feel like without that Malagos, Neobility actually might not have had a way to win this game. That's a pretty, pretty sizable one. Mm -hmm. And so... Is there any way that Chess Dude has lethal here? Assuming both juggles of the <laughs> Unleash the Hound go face and he's got kill command and well, then another juggle. He's got 15 guaranteed if he wants it. 
you can do like 18-ish damage to the face with perfect RNG. So I, I can't spot a really good uh, way to get lethal here. Is there a way he can maybe just kill the Malagos? Because that's a win condition for Chess Dude at this point. It certainly is. Kill command and then a trade in would kill the, the Malagos. Mm -hmm. It would leave him with a one health Savannah high main and he would have used kill command. That's a, it's a big investment here. But Chess Dude has to think about what this Malagos means. If this sticks to the board, is Chess Dude going to lose? And at 15, that is an incredibly likely scenario. Druids are pretty much stocked to the brim with enough damage spells to get the job done. Yeah, it's quickly become like the most spell heavy class in the entire game, Druid, which is kind of weird. It always used to be Rogue in the beginning, but since expansions and new cards have been added, and Chess Dude is going to respect the threat of Malagos. Landing, Take that down. Landing the Knife Juggler there, yet again, very important because it allows him to hang on to the Knife Juggler. Yeah, the Knife Juggler is just staying alive. It's dealt an extra four da five damage at this point simply because it landed the first juggle onto the Azure Drake, and then it landed the second one onto the Malagos and is now connected twice as well. I mean, it's got good motivation, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah, like Chess Dude's just talking to his knife juggler, just like, if you miss, I have to trade you in, you're gonna die. And knife juggler's like, ah, I'm gonna hit boss, yeah. I got this. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good time to be landing it. Mm -hmm. I, I personally don't want to fight dragons. Yeah, yeah, me neither. Yeah. I'm, I'm a 2-2. <laughs> <laughs> You're 2-1. Yeah, I'm a 2-1, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I really don't want to fight dragons. Uh, oh, the swipe here. Interesting. I, I was going to say, I think he's at a point where if he goes for the Ragnaros, he may actually have a win condition in the game, and going for swipe might be too defensive. But I think what this is coming out to, and the reason why the ability feels like he can be so defensive and try and outlast his opponent's hand, is because he knows some information about the hand. That Unleash the Hounds on the far left has oh been there. Gosh. Yeah, yeah. This this totally counteracts everything I was <laughs> saying, where he's going to outvalue <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, the top deck changes the story a little bit. But Neobility is putting Chess Dude on having an Unleash the Hounds. Chess Dude picked it up on the prior turn when the Knife Juggler was in play, signaling that it cost three mana. And and uh, Neobility knows basically at this point it wasn't Animal Companion because there were situations to play that. He knows it's not Bow, so he can very concisely conclude that that's an Unleash the Hounds. And he was feeling, you know, Chess Dude's only got one real card in his hand. I can maybe stabilize with this rag. Yeah. But a uh, couple of cards it could potentially have been, or Call of the Wild, or or well, maybe he doesn't Quick beat Call of the Wild anyway. Exactly. Like there's and no line the of play that he can take that beats Call of the Wild. Exactly. Anymore. And that's why that's I actually love Neobility's line last turn, mm -hmm. uh, given all those factors. It, you know, if it happens to be Unleash the Hounds, which it just happens to be so here. Yeah. It, there is a win condition. Yeah. Suddenly. He can still he could he could win by outlasting yeah, the Hunter's Savannah pressure. Highman is just that's yeah. the the elbow off the top turnbuckle. There's yeah. Neobility's not coming back from that. Yeah. Uh, Chess dude had either Rag or you know. Uh, Savannah there off the top to just end the game. So even Call of the Wild in that position, Chess yeah, would have had a dead turn, and mm -hmm. it still would have been an incredibly strong draw. Very rare that that's the case. Yeah. So new ability is still just trying to play the odds, trying to figure out what puts him in the best position going forward. And I think at this point, uh, if he plays the Ragnaros, he's got to. He's, he's just dead, so that can't really be his best play. So he kind of has to go with the Nourish for cards to try and find something. What 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 gets drawn off that? I mean, oh, wait, actually, if it hits a two two, and then next turn, he can set up some sort of lethal. I guess he's Ooh, just. I do like this actually. So, I, so, oh, okay. So, so this is important. If he nails the two two here, the Ragnaros can out. Well, throw that out the window. The idea was Ragnaros could hit face, and maybe he draws extra damage to pile on top. Yeah, of but that. there's no damage on top of that that wins him the game, right? Uh, nourish into swipe and living roots. Okay. That, All right. That would be the that would, that would be the out. Yeah, I mean, th these are the situations where you have to try to craft sort of like 1% outs to win the game. So we're sitting here like all of these plays are not good. And then, you know, Neo Ability is trying to figure out how do I win if I draw runner, runner this with my Ragnaros doing the perfect thing and upside down question mark sideways stuff. You know, it's, it's that scene from Hangover, all the numbers and yeah. formulas are going <laughs> yeah. by. That's what ends up happening there. So game number one, it goes over to Chestu with a 1-0 lead. We'll see if Neo Ability can bounce back right after this. Welcome back. Game number two will be getting underway shortly, but there is something I do want to talk about in this matchup, and it's the mage difference, because that okay. is a drastic difference in these two lineups. We see, of course, Chess Dude had banned away the Ability's warrior deck, mm -hmm. but largely, I think, in part of because of that freeze mage being in yeah. the build. And Neobility banned out Shaman from Chess Dude, 
and he's got Tempo Mage. Mm -hmm. That is such a big difference coming yeah. into a lineup when you have Freeze Mage and the, the mirror match is kind of there. Yeah, and we're going to get right underway with the Freeze Mage from Chess Dude going up against the matchup you really don't want to see with Freeze Mage. You know, you don't want to see Control Warrior first off, but the second thing you don't want to see, you never want to play against Druid just because Druid has such great ways for healing with cards like Feral Rage and uh, just great ways of dealing damage and also Moonglade Portal, Ragnaros, burst damage with Malagos. Like, you can't freeze off a Druid. They're still going to be able to get damage in. Yeah, a lot of times I feel like Freeze Mage can get a handle on this matchup. Violet Teacher certainly is a lot of pressure, okay. but a Frost Nova Doomsayer can shut that down. The big difference, I'd say, in this matchup is quite literally the healing and then the Ragnaros and Malagos as the yeah. endgame threats. Ragnaros poses such a massive threat to Freeze Mage because it's not actually something that you can stop from attacking and Malagos is the same vein. It's just burst damage from hand. Yeah. So how does Chess Dude actually win this matchup? He needs to have very key doomsayers on those things. A lot of times he needs to hope that new ability doesn't get uh, burn damage from Raven Idol or he just needs to do something exceptionally quick. Like I'll, sometimes you get the freeze mage hand where you have ice block, you have Alexstrasza, you have Emperor Thorson, you have all the burn and you never draw any cards and you just win the game. Because at the end of the day, the whole purpose of cycle cards such as Novice Engineer or Loot Hoarder is minus one card from my deck. Minus one card from my deck. So at the end of the day, you're basically killing them with the same 10 cards every time. If you just start with those 10 cards and never have to draw anything, Freeze Mage can literally beat almost anything. And that, that's the key there is that it, it can yeah. beat almost literally anything except for Control Warrior, except. of course, because they have 75,000 health. Yeah, <laughs> it gets a bit tricky with that one, but Neo Ability off to a great start. He was able to pick up some life gain in the form of Bite off of Raven Idol. That's going to give him four additional armor moving forward. His hand is nicely coming together for Chestu, though. He's found Alex Straza and Emperor Thorson already. Mm -hmm. He has a key Doomsayer with Frost Nova in hand. He's yeah. got an ice block that he can set in the future. This hand, with a couple more card draws here, I mean, he's got Loot Hoarder and Arcane Intellect. This could shape up very well for Chess Dude over the next couple turns. These draws are going to be critical. Yeah, it's definitely a favorable hand from Chess Dude, but also a favorable hand from Neobility. Like, it's no slouch when you get to go uh, Emperor Thorsan into Ragnaros and turn seven against a Freeze Mage. It certainly is not, and... Albeit Neobility's hand isn't fantastic for turn four, mm -hmm. the point is those two key turns you just yep. named. The Emperor Thoris on turn six, of course, oftentimes requires attention, uh, lest the threat of a very, very early Malagos yeah. be there. And the threat of Ragnaros is probably the most dangerous thing for Chess Dude at this point. It, that one will require attention. Mm -hmm. Blizzard and, and Frost Nova, not good. Yeah, not great. You don't want to really AoE down a Ragnaros, but a lot of times you have to just because well, if the Druid gains a bunch of life and then plays high priority threats that you have to expend your burn on, well then how are you gonna kill him at the end of the day? He's right. gained life and you've spent your burn removing minions, you just run out of damage as the Freeze Mage sometimes. And this is all assuming that you have time to play Alex oh, Straza yeah. <laughs> and time to draw these mm -hmm. burn spells. So. so it's a lot of stuff working against Chess Dude in this matchup. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's it's really tough. And Neobility, even in the later stages of the game, could just play Malagos on turn nine with no spells. And Chess Dude pretty much cannot double fireball it. If he double fireballs it, he's not going to have the damage to close out the game with just, you know, Moonglade Portal and Feral Rage existing. So it's times when the threat of power is almost greater than the actual power itself. Yeah. I mean, the spell damage is very critical, more so from Chess Dude's perspective than it is from Neobility's. And we do see uh, Neobility here in a kind of a, a awkward position because he knows what's coming. When you see your opponent just play Doomsayer out on the field with uh, nothing else, you have to assume that they're going to play Emperor Thoris in the following turn because it is turn five and he has the coin. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting turn. Chess Dude, of course, slated for Emperor Thorson, I'd say, especially with the freshly drawn Ice Lance here. Mm -hmm. uh, having Alex Straza and being able to play Alex Straza and Frost Nova, oftentimes a very critical play against decks that can launch a wide assault in a single turn. But how does Neobility respond to this? Does he feel like this is a turn where a Ragnaros flip is ever a possibility here? And I don't think it is. The Ragnaros is such an important card in the matchup. I don't know. He's getting to that point where he's got so much damage in hand that if Ragnaros goes face, 
he might just kill him. <laughs> he can very easily do eight damage next turn, so he's already got 16, basically, if Ragnaros goes face. So I honestly wouldn't have hated the Ragnaros. It'd be kind of like akin to the play that Muzzy did a little bit earlier on in the tournament. But uh, I can also understand, you know, remove Emperor Thorsen against Freeze Mage. It's just a much slower approach, right? The, the other thing, too, is that the armor total is nothing to scoff at. Sure. He gets the to ability the hero power. If, if you get Alex Strauss and you have five armor, Mm -hmm. That's that's an extra fireball that your opponent has to have yeah. in the equation, and with bite in hand, the armor potential is a very realistic possibility. Yeah, so new ability kind of just making you know big picture turns rather than rushing anything. He's realizing how important the hero power is, how important it is to save bite for after Alex and things like that, and just gonna set up his cards in a good position. Probably try and get Ragnaros fireballed, and then out heal chest dude at the end of the day. Sounds like a solid game plan to me, and yeah. I think starting with Fandral Nourish is a great way to get that underway. Yeah, he's able to ramp up to 10 mana, which he would have done anyway next turn, but he gets two mana crystals that he can use in the immediate this way. Yeah, it's the it's it's like a discount on Nourish. Mm -hmm. It's like a three mana draw three, which is pretty good. No, I wouldn't play that. No. <laughs> Especially not like in, uh, I don't know, like a combo Druid deck or something. Yeah, yeah. We used to pay seven mana to draw two, you know that? Really? Yeah, I mean, granted, we got a 5-5, five five, but... Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was like, <laughs> what, would th what did that card exist? What did I miss? <laughs> All right, talking back, pre-nerf Ancient of Lore. Yeah, the 5-5 five five kind of made that a little bit better. <laughs> just, just a, yeah, a teensy bit. All right, we're at Chess Dude. He has the Ice Block up already, so he doesn't need to worry about setting that up. So the main priority here is just find Burn that he can deploy after Alex Straza. Yeah, and with two Ice Lances... Something as simple as a Frostbolt, now that he's picked up the Fireball, is is a very welcome sight at this point. But still a lot of work to do. Fandral, not really a huge threat, but you can see Chess Dude very much not only valuing controlling his hand size here, where if there's a minion left up, it's very easy for Neo Ability to force a burn. But with nine cards in hand, it's very easy to force two burns at that point. And there's still some critical cards that I don't think he can afford to lose right now. Sure, yeah. Trying to make sure that he doesn't get overdrawn and also trying to guarantee that he can draw two cards off the Acolyte. If he yep. doesn't freeze the Fandral, then the Fandral can most likely just trade into the Acolyte. Yep. Very, very rare that I, you see something quite like this in the Freeze Mage matchup. Yeah. Most of the time, uh, they I feel like they're spending a lot of resources to handle what the Druid's throwing at him. And here, he's just literally concerned about having too many cards in hand. Yeah, and I, I think the reason why he just feels comfortable enough throwing away the Frost Nova is because he's got two Blizzard and a Frost Nova. It was like, first glance, it looks absolutely insane to Frost Nova just a Fandral. But when you think about it, he's got enough freezes for the rest of the game already in his hand since right. he drew all of them. Yeah, that's, that's a big hindrance, too, at this point. I mean, certain he can identify how the next few turns are rolling, but ideally he would just rather have the damage at this point. And the ability going to take that time to start the unload. Yeah. Ragnaros here, I honestly, I don't think Neo Ability minds that that much. I, it's not great, though, and you can see that Frost Nova paying off for Chess Dude there. He was able to save eight life, basically. Oh, here's the big that. worry. He's got so much damage, too. Just count the damage in his hand. That's... Wow, that 6, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 17, 18 damage if he can ping with it. Yeah, 18 damage in the hand of Chess Dude. And suddenly, this is a bit of a troublesome spot. Yeah. The, the ability can answer this Alex Straza, but can he answer the Alex Straza and extend his life total? Because that is that is scary what Chess Dude has just thrown at him. As far as he's concerned, the four left cards of Chess Dude's hand could very well be Emperor Burn spells. Yeah, they, they really could, so... It's a, a bit tricky to navigate, and the second Innervate pickup really does help him here, and that's going to, if he uses double Innervate plus Bite, he can get outside of the range of the Burst of Chest Dude. If he doesn't, he is going to be in range of the Burst of Chest Dude and just die the following turn. You saw him here. His instinct was to reach for Power of the Wild, but taking a moment to think about it now, Oh, oh no. He wants to get out the Arcane Giant. Yeah, but I don't I don't think Neo Ability feels like he's dead at all. It's very rare that Freeze Mage this early in the game can do 17 damage. Chess Dude's Freeze Mage drew exceptionally well. A couple of Arcane Intellects and an Acolyte of Pain can definitely do that. Yeah. We saw him cycle of the Blood Mage on turn two as well. I mean, he thinned his deck pretty significantly and uh, was able, you know, the opening draw, I think, was really the most important part of this, where he ended up picking up Alex Straza, and he picked yeah. up Emperor Thorson, and he had a Doomsayer to tempo mm -hmm. straight into it. Those were all very important factors. And then drew into the burn. Yep. Like, that's exactly the Freeze Mage dream. He didn't have to cycle too much to get the cards he needed. And uh, that's it, why it's such a powerful deck and people like it so much, is because it can have, 
you know, such powerful draws, such powerful sequences. It's got such a strong game plan. But Neability maybe could have played that a little safer, right? With the two Innervates there at the end, he could have just traded the Fandral off. He didn't need to play the 8-8 there. He had the Ragnaros pressuring. I would have really liked to see him just reach for the double Innervate bite, just make sure that he's not going to die that turn, and then play the, the portal after that with Ragnaros just continuing to clock his opponent. He can force multiple extra burn spells to have to be in chest dude's hand in that position. Yeah. And while I don't think it's necessarily likely that he gets out of that game because of it, the point is that he can extend the game. And if chest dude has a few dead draws after that, we, we see that all the time. Yeah. That is not very unlikely. I, I am in total agreement with you here. I think that that was a very, very liberal use of, uh, of an attack plan from Neo Ability. Mm -hmm. And that chess dude, uh, you know, just was able to capitalize on it. Just a fantastic game for him. Yeah, a really well played freeze mage game. And we can see here the crowds. Santa Ana and, of course, yeah. uh, Toronto being one another location where players have come together to enjoy Hearthstone. And I'll tell you what, I wish, wouldn't mind being there right now. It looks like a great environment. Yeah, Toronto a little bit sadder than Santa Ana, maybe just because Silent Storm's there and just got defeated that game. Yeah, just uh, it's, it's one I of mean those. Ability. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I was like <laughs> wrong Canadian. There's, there's so many Canadians in the tournament. Yeah, three in this one alone. That's, that, that's yeah. honestly kind of rare. It's a pretty big representation. Typically, you know, not the biggest North American representer, but doing quite well for themselves here. Might get another slot at the World Championship. Get to the finals again. Last year they did it with Hot Form, so. Who knows? I'm going to be honest. I, I'm really liking Silent Storm's lineup for it, too. I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, he was able to take the his match so cleanly with being almost targeted is uncon a more unconventional approach to the Control Warrior with C'Thun. Yeah. Just gave him the extra power to get it done. Kind of, kind of going back to this match, though, Chess Dude is now up two games to zero, and Neo Ability has got to be sweating that. Yeah, it's really hard to come back down two to zero, actually, just because of how it changes the win rates dynamic and how much more you kind of have to high roll a little bit to get back in there. So it's going to be really tough for Neobility to close this one out. The one thing he does have going for him is that all of his decks are kind of a soft target on Warrior. So not quite the same extent as how Frozen was. And we saw even with Frozen's super target on Warrior, he was unable to get the reverse sweep on Warrior. But Neobility's decks all have a favorable matchup against Warrior. Yeah, and Druid, Druid honestly, I feel like Druid can almost be counted out of this equation right now for Chess Dude. I think Ch Chess Dude navigates those sorts of builds very excellently the combo and, builds yeah. and with druid that is so paramount to the game plan if you find yourself wasting a resource or or not tempoing properly in a certain turn that deck really falls behind mm -hmm. but that's something we haven't really seen from chess dude it's kind of understanding where cards are fitting into the puzzle is his major strength where the game is concerned. Yeah, he's a big picture sort of huge game plan, think seven turns ahead sort of guy. You, you know, you might expect that with the name like Chess Dude. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he, he navigates combo decks very, very well. Very strong Druid player. And Druid being one of the tier one decks right now, you expect him to do quite well with it. And we're going to get a glimpse of it in this game. Number three, Neobility is going to have to pick something up. But Hunter is certainly a its certainly a build that can give Druid trouble at times. Mm -hmm. um, but Chess Dude's build, once again, it's kind of in the same way that Neo Abilities was, where it doesn't have these large Ancient of War turns that's relying on to stabilize. And if you run into a deadly shot, the game has ended. Mm -hmm. It's much more focused around Violet. I'm sorry, around uh, the combo in this one. He actually doesn't have the Violet Teacher builds in his, excuse me. Um, it's the double Mire Keeper version yeah. with a little bit more of the end game with Yogg-Saron. Yeah, it's the, the Moonglade Portal version. Typically speaking, players were running Moonglade Portal and Gadgets and Auctioneer, but uh, in the later trends of Druid with the, the all-in combo version, they run Moonglade Portal and Ragnaros instead of the Gadgets and Auctioneer. So they're like, yeah, we don't need to draw cards. We'll just jam an 8-8 in there. Yeah, and, con and contrasting the Hunter builds as well, it's also very interesting. Again, these two guys had class mirrors, mm -hmm. but they're they're the way they've built them is very different. Neo Ability has come with uh, two huge toads instead of the knife juggler slot. He's got two injured Cavaldiers and two desert camels alongside it. Yeah, instead of uh, the more aggressive uh, sort of top the, end, yeah. Yeah, he, I mean, he also has the two Savannah High Main, one Ragnaros, one Call of the Wild, sure. with the major difference being in the five slot, he's got a single Stranglethorn Tiger as well to try to ensure that five damage and the beast sticking. 
interesting hunter builds. He's going to find himself having some success here, actually, because there's no one drops in the Druid. So this is one of the matchups you really want to hit with a camel oriented deck. Whereas if you hit a matchup where they have one drops, the camel can oftentimes punish you because your opponent gets to attack with the, the, their one drop first. So uh, pretty cool deck. We saw a lot of the G2 guys kind of highlighting camel decks in best of seven format because there's not a lot of viable classes in the game that run one drops. Right. I mean, it's limited to quite literally Warlock and to, uh, and to Hunter for the most part. And Shaman sometimes yeah. with Sh the more mid-range variants. I, Shaman, of course, was that was auto ban status. Yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah, if you expect the, the Shaman to be gone, then yeah, there's only two other real classes that run one drops. And sometimes Hunter doesn't even run one drops in the heavy mid-range variants. Chess dude gonna opt for inter innervate on Meyer Keeper. The presence on board, I think, is very important, especially considering uh, that Neobility is playing the Camel version. I think that having a three-three out that can potentially threaten that in future turns is really important to his game plan. Yeah, just going full aggressive, full tempo, not worried about value. Could end up biting him because he doesn't have any follow-up to this tempo play. And oftentimes, you know, tempo play chained into tempo play usually works better because you don't want to expend all your resources and then end up passing. Yeah, that's a weak draw from Chastute as well. I mean, yeah. that's about as weak as it gets in the build. So I imagine he's slated to kill this big bad wolf here, but that leaves Neobility with sort of a weak turn. Eaglehorn Bow goes not exactly where Hunter wants to be. But you still get to have it developed for usage on later turns, so Ooh. it's not that bad. But yeah, this is most likely going to be a stronger play for him, just being able to develop two minions here, get him out on the board. Now, I'm injured Cavaldier, it doesn't doesn't typically hang on for long versus Druid, but it'll get the job done. Ooh, that's an interesting one. He's, he's gonna get so punished. Look at look at well, Neobility's hand. I'm, I'm curious if he is. Moonglade portals first. So say he he uses uh, Shapeshift to take out the injured Cavaldier this okay. time. He sees development from Neobility, takes a bit of damage, Moonglade portals. That that could be a turn that enables Ragnaros. Afterwards, and Moonglade Portal can drop some very significant stuff. He's actually going to choose to wipe out the huge toad here, uh, which is consideration for Houndmaster. He has to be making reads here. He has to have really good reads on what it could be. But at the same time, it's just as likely to be a deadly shot on the far left in the ability's hand as it is to be a high main, a call of the wild, a Ragnaros. So it's going to be so hard for him to really pick out that that's what it is, and then make a you know objectively worse play to play around the deadly shot. Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with just the fear of Houndmaster. Like, even if it's drawn at that point, Chess Dude's just not going to win in that spot. I mean, leaving... Plus, he also cuts out the three power attacking him turn after turn. Okay. So I think there is some real merit to, to taking out the huge toad there. Moonfire is not a critical card in this matchup. Typically, I'd say the Druid's win rate is more seated uh, on the back of Ragnaros and Arcane Giants. Here comes the Ragnaros. So he is not picking up on the potential deadly shot there, so... He is going to be kind of shut down here. Doesn't really have too many options there. He could have tried to play around it with some subpar plays. You know, there is an infested wolf on the table, so you can expect the Ragnaros not to get too much done. But I think the pickup of the swipe really led Chestu to the decision to innervate out the Ragnaros because he's like, even if it hits the infested wolf and there's a board flooded with 1-1s, one I can just swipe behind this and clean up all those 1-1s, one and then Ragnaros will again be getting high value. Yeah, and Neobility making a great read on that situation alone, foregoing the Desert Camel here in order to avoid a swipe being devastating to his board position. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, it doesn't force swipe from Chesty when that happens, and does that mean it opens the window for this Azure Drake? Sure does. It looks like uh, Chess Dude's going to be just developing Azure Drake. He does need to kind of be careful. His life total is getting quite low for against Hunter. Even though Hunters have slowed down a little bit, it, they're, they're nothing to mess around with when you start getting into, you know, the low teens of health total. Yep, kill Command, of course. Always massive burst potential. Neobility, he's going to let it rip, and I'm sorry to say it, but you're going down this turn. <laughs> Yeah, he is clearing off the Ezra Drake. Was interested to see. He had a, like some argument to go face there. He doesn't have any burn in his hand currently, but uh, Chess Dude also doesn't run really any taunts in his build, so uh, there's always some merit to just pushing in a bunch of face damage. Yeah, I think the one downside of that is Chess Dude gets to hang around with a 4-4, and then that in return kind of clocks him a bit. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking the Neo build, he's very concerned with that. I mean, he's trading an Eagle Horn Bow and one power to make sure that an Azure Drake is not hitting him in the face for the rest of the game. I think sure. that could 
certainly be of significance here. But Chess Dude, these turns are getting tough because they're he's an eight mana territory and we're playing one card at a time. And he really wants to be playing two. <laughs> There's uh, nothing that would make Chess Dude happier than being able to Moonglade Portal and swipe this turn, but he's got to make a decision of which one's better for him. And uh, right now, if he plays swipe, it gains, gains him five life. But no is it going to gain him more life in the future? Is he going to be able to combo it with, say, Azure Drake next turn, potentially? Or is he taking too much damage at the expense of not using it this turn? Because swipe doesn't always heal for five. Sometimes right. it heals for two, and then you're feeling much worse about Whoa, the situation. Whoa, Koldara Drake is huge. That okay. is actually really important. Neo Ability would have to trade in the board to handle this right now. And if he doesn't do that, Chess Dude is free to shapeshift as many times he has the mana to do so. And when you give Druid the ability to gain five armor and five attack a turn without having to actually expend a resource, mm -hmm. that can be very dangerous. Yeah, it's like Chess Dude has infinite bites. And this camel from Neo Ability unfortunately for him, doesn't generate any one drop. So now Chess Dude has the information that the second injured Cavaldier is the card in the ability's hand. Wow, that's a really good point, actually. Yeah, that's, that's huge. Now, Chess Dude has 100% information of how to play around Neobility's hand as effective as possible. And there's that Caldera Drake you were talking about. This is going to play a huge role into allowing Chess Dude to gain ridiculous amounts of life via spamming the hero power button. Right. I mean, normally you look at this situation and Swipe's not going to clear the board. But if he does this properly, he could clear the board. Yeah. Yeah, he could definitely clear the board. All he's got to do is... Uh, Use a few hero powers. <laughs> this is this is a really interesting turn because it's also kind of putting Chess Dude right back in the same situation he was, where he goes, I want to play two cards a turn. Mm -hmm. hmm. With Koldara Drake out, do I start only playing one? And I, I don't think that's going to be the case. It looks like Swipe is slated. Yeah, he's going to just trade into the 1-1 one, one here, swipe the 2-4, and uh, clean up the board. Unless he's thinking he needs to be more aggressive and then uh, push the six damage to face. Yeah, this, this chess dude strikes me as a this is my opportunity to choke the game out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of player, and that's exactly what he's going to opt to take. With the information of Injured Cavaldir being there, chess dude has very, very low amounts of burn uh, that will actually reach him at this point. Yeah, and it, it feels like this is a situation where Neobility is going to try and go all in with a quick shot to the Ooh, face. Ooh, actually, Kill Command would win the game here. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think it's, uh, you know, the time to try and go all in, and he has a chance to do it if he un if he is unable to, you know, close it out this turn, though. That Feral Rage is going to come out for Chess Dude and really shut things down. Yeah, I think that's Neo Bill. Oh! oh! My gosh, Chess Dude winces when he sees the kill command. Wow. That, that was is unbelievable. What a huge draw for Neo Ability. Yeah, I, I, I support Chess Dude's line of play of not doing the Feral Rage there because, it, you know, the only way he loses is Quick Shot into Kill Command. That's what needed to happen because you know the card in Neo Ability's hand is an injured Cavaldir. If you don't know that, then you can assume it's potentially a burn spell and then your opponent can go top deck burn spell with a burn spell in hand to kill you but you know for a fact it's injured Cavaldir, so they have to get Quick Shot into Kill Command to kill you exactly in that order. It's going to be paramount for Chess Dude to keep his cool. We'll see if he can right after this. Two, one lead for Chess Dude at this point. Neo Ability with a smile from Lady Luck able to pick up game number three. He was in dire straits, but a quick shot into Kill Command yeah. was able to save the game. He needed either quick shot into Kill Command or quick shot into Animal Companion Roll Huffer. So the odds of him winning that game were not very high. And uh, Chess Dude, you know, set himself up in a position. He was like, figured developing the board was better since that was the only thing that killed him since he had such a strong read on his opponent's hand but unfortunately for him unable to grab the wind here so it is going to be the next game chess dude switching off the druid onto a uh, control warrior up against neobility's mid-range shaman yeah, but this isn't just any control warrior there's a few choices in here that are quite interesting namely blood hoof brave a single copy which has often been uh, fairly extinct in the metagame uh, for the past couple of, uh, of months here. Does have a copy of Gorhal, and then at the very, very top of it, the man himself, Deathwing. Yeah, and I think this is in a reaction to not banning Shaman with his lineup. I think this is uh, 
a, a warrior deck designed to counter shaman. You have the typical answers to shaman cards, which is you know your double revenge, your double brawl. But now, in order to help him deal with shaman boards even more, he has the Berengeddon, which can potentially set up a board clear, and he has the Deathwing, which can be used to clean up you know a big Thunderbluff Valiant boards that are really hard to deal with once your brawls are gone. Yeah, that kind of takes the place of what Yogg-Saron used to do yeah. in these style of builds. Not only that, but Deathwing certainly poses a much larger threat to some other matchups where Yogg-Saron is not quite as impactful. Sure, yeah, you can definitely you know, cheese out some Druids or any other related to tempo matchups, maybe even get a Rogue on the ropes because of it. Yeah, we saw it happen earlier. Yeah. Deathwing was certainly an important role in, uh, in a victory over Muzzy. Yeah, but Chess Dude's off to a really slow start, and Neability is off to the races. His hand has been everything a Shaman wants and more, so it, ah, it could yes. be a quick one if uh, Chess Dude isn't able to find you know, either a Fiery War Axe or some way to really get a handle on this, because you have to imagine Neability is just going to keep jamming threats. He I, could I mean, it's, it's the old Tunnel Trog into Totem Golem, into Flame Tongue Totem, and begin pushi pushing massive damage. Yeah, I, the chest, dude. I, I really like the flame tank totem here over the uh, the second totem golem, and the reason why is because if chest dude had a fiery war axe, he would have played that over the slam, or he would have went coin fiery war axe into slam on the next turn. So new ability is making reads based on how chest dude's adapting to this board to be 100% sure that there's no fiery war axe in the hand, and if there's no fiery war axe in the hand, then he can maybe get huge value out of this flame tank totem, having it to be removed by something like a bash, which is just absolutely huge comparatively to when it normally gets removed by a weapon or a minion trading into it. It's not only that, but it opens up his hand a little bit more as well. You know, mm -hmm. in this matchup, it's very typical that you want to see four mana turns be two actions taken. Yeah. And with Neo Ability's hand, he very much wants to get Tunnel Trog, I'm sorry, the Totem Golem and the other Flame Tongue online about as quickly as he can. This isn't a matchup where he has the liberty of taking his time and relying on Thunder Bluff Valiant to to get massive potential at the end game, he's got to kill Chess Dude because this deck is built to tackle Shaman oh in the my. light. He's going to be able to play two totems this turn if he wants to and discount his thing from below to costing two in the following turn, which uh, is the line of play I favor. You, you see your opponent still doesn't have a weapon to remove your your flame tank totem. Oh, he's going to take a little bit of a slower approach here and now, just get the totem. Doesn't want to extend into coin brawl. Ah, that's exactly where I was I was about to head here is that Chesu does have the coin and typically heading into four mana, you're not concerned with brawl, but if there's the option for an excess mana on the other side, you typically want to be a little bit more cautious of it. It looks like he wants to add the totem golem anyway. Okay. And if playing around brawl was the major concern here, I could certainly see blood mage being a consideration, but this also strengthens his position against Brawl to a certain degree, where now there's a 50% chance he'll keep a three power minion on board. Yeah, I can I can get behind this line of play. If there is a Brawl, then like you said, 50% of the time, he's got a pretty decent board still. If there is no Brawl, your opponent's dead now. <laughs> so <laughs> the, I, I really like the, the, typically speaking, I'm a more of never halfway plays. But there's always a situation that comes up like this where halfway in between the two lines is the right play. Yeah, this is honestly quite a rare situation where there is an in-between that, that makes a lot of sense. It's, mm -hmm. And Neobility has spotted it. You know, typically when the aggressor finds themselves in these situations, they have to throw caution to the wind and hope that yeah. the, the, other, the opposing side doesn't have the massive board clear. Mm -hmm. But in this situation, there is a middle ground. Yeah, and chess dudes realizing he has to brawl here. He doesn't really have a choice. There's too much pressure on the board and he has to do it. And you see the ability pretty happy with the fact that brawl got used and uh, gotta be pretty happy with that outcome. The healthy totem golem stays alive. And this is an opportunity for flame tongue totem, a hero power and a free thing from below afterwards. Yep. And when you've just seen a brawl from your opponent, this may be more as a situation where Neo ability thinks, yes, now is the time to actually make him have it. If he doesn't have the lone copy of brawl, he will win the game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Chess Dude really needs to put together basically just Brawl, but he is at 12. Neobility put him down to 12, which is oftentimes very risky because that means revenge is going to be live. That's a hot draw. Shield block into Shield Slam can extend the life total a bit. Yeah. If you're not going to draw a card that eliminates the board position, something that buys you another turn in a more reasonable board position is about as good as a second best gets. Yeah, it's a very strong card, very strong card. and. 
chess dude being at 12 life, if he's able to find revenge, then the ability's board's just gonna get wiped the following turn. So having that extra cycle to get towards that revenge that is now live is absolutely crucial. So much riding on the next couple of draws for Chess yeah. It feels like he's been in that spot a couple of times now, too. Whether it have been Neo Billy's draws or his own, he has found himself in, in a situation where one single draw could very easily change the outcome. It's usually what happens between two high-level players, especially with all mirror match decks, that you get into those spots where one draw is so crucial, and that is a crucial draw for Neo Billy able to get that thing from below for zero. He can develop such a strong board behind this with the brawl being expended. And, and he knows that there is no brawl in yeah. Chess Dude's hand right he now. He can That's... very accurately see, yeah. <laughs> if Chess Dude is willing to brawl the totem, flame tongue totem, totem golem, totem golem board, he certainly was willing to brawl it with the thing from below in place of one of the totem golems. And now the board states wider. Neo ability is putting the test to Chess Dude. This turn, Chess Dude has to draw big. And that, that Fiery War Axe is way too late. Yeah, and the ability, we can see him even holding back a little bit here. He holds back the Feral Spirits in case there is that revenge for three mana across the, or for three damage across the board to, to clean it up. So he is going to have a reload after the revenge because he feels like this board's strong enough to get the job done. And that patience might have actually put him in trouble, but with the Taunt Totem, I guess he can afford to do it. Yep, a lot of it's going to boil down to... And revenge. This particular draw right here. Oh, it's not it. Chest dude doesn't have it. And because of that taunt totem, he can't war X off the flame tongue totem. So it's going to be very hard for him to remove too much pressure from this board. There's still going to be seven damage left up on the field, even after the executes used. Yep. Seven on the field, 12 in the bank for chest dude. This is not looking, this is not looking so good. Neo ability is quickly drawing deposits from the chess dude bank of life total. And now he knows that there is no revenge. He was able to pick up that read there because slam revenge would have been used there instead of execute. So now he can freely develop the feral spirits if he wants. Yep. Azure Drake is looking mighty appealing as well. It's yeah. kind of, even if this gets caught in an AOE, it's, it kind of refunds itself mm -hmm. with that extra draw. And of course, more hero powers alongside of it, chess dude, it's got to be now. And honestly, Revenge still will be good enough, but we're looking at two copies of Revenge and one copy of Brawl. Those are the only cards that are going to get Chess Dude out of this right now. Yeah, Baron Geddon's not strong enough of an AoE. Deathwing's too slow. Uh, double Ghoul doesn't do enough. It's, you know, maybe a Shield Block into a Shield Slam. Maybe a Bash yeah, sure. could buy him another turn, but... In order to really get back in the game, he needs a board clear, and he needs it right now. Yeah, it's it's going to be really tough for him to manage. And that's not a board clear. And that looks like that's just going to be it. Chess Dude is going to be going down to this mid-range Shaman with a warrior that seemed to be designed to try and counter it. It's just that Tunnel Trog Totem Golem Flame Tongue Totem Golem Flame Tongue start was just so powerful from the ability. Multiple thing from below is drawn in, yeah. added in there. And the yeah. way he spaced it around the AoE was just just beautiful. He put up enough pressure to get the job done without putting out too much. Right. Even even with as strong as a hand as Neo Ability had, he found a way to navigate it in a situation where Chess Dude just had no opportunity to get okay, back in. Okay, wait a it. minute. We have a taunt now. He can't he's eliminate anything enough. else, though. Yeah. It's he's at 9. I mean, he can... He can get to no. 11, and he's he's technically speaking... It's still dead because both totems yeah. run over the... Yeah, he's still dead. The Cyclopean Horror, I believe it's called. Yeah, Cyclopean Horror. And then there's 11 points of damage remaining. That healing totem will make its way over to the Flame Tongue totem, find a new friend. Yeah. Never leave home without one. Well, he's hoping the ability makes a mistake here, and... Oh, there's also multiple options on how to clear yeah, the Cyclopean yeah. Golem as well. I was well. just saying, on board, if Chess Dude can figure out if he's uh, going to live or not, but he is donezo. It is a 2-2 two, two series now. 2-0 two for Chess Dude, now 2-0 for New Ability. Wow, look at Chess Dude's face. Mm -hmm. I think that says it all. Yeah, it's uh, That's one of the decks Chess Dude really needs to get a win with, too, just because that Warrior deck is oftentimes so targeted by players, and we can see New Ability's lineup does soft target the Warrior a little bit. So if he was able to get that win with the Warrior, I'd say he'd be at a fantastic spot, have the series in the bag. But since Chess Dude's Warrior got kind of stomped there, he's going to have to queue it up again against the Tempo Mage with the extra minions that's favored against Warrior and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's it's a very difficult spot, honestly. 
um, kind of showing you why Shaman is often banned there. You can see the Toronto location where Silent, I'm sorry, um, Neobility, Neobility is yeah. playing from. It uh, looks, man, I, stuff like this is so awesome. Like I've yeah. gone to some of these fireside gatherings like, when I was at eSports Arena for uh, winter and spring prelims. They were just, it's such a wonderful thing to be around other Hearthstone players who have that like-minded interest. It, it really, it's a different, it's a feeling very unlike you get with anything else. Yeah, everyone's uh, usually having a pretty good time. There's usually pretty good food at those things, too. So I, I like going just play some Hearthstone, <laughs> casually hang out with a lot of friends. It's usually a pretty good time. And if you go to one of these ones, you can actually see some of the players. Yeah, these are open to the public. You can just show up and enjoy some Hearthstone with the fans and with the players. That's, that's what it's all about. Uh, so game number five is uh, is approaching. Mm -hmm. And this is it's getting ever more critical for both players. I feel like whoever wins the next game is really far ahead at that point. Oh, yeah. And Tempo Mage is what it's going to be for Neobility. This was the reason he didn't ban out uh, the warrior from Chess Dude. Is this wasn't Freeze Mage like Chess Dude's was. Yeah, yeah. This instead is a deck that's oftentimes very strong against the Control Warrior deck. It has things like Cabalist Tome that just packed so much insane value and also just really strong amounts of early game pressure and burn damage to follow it up. So if the warrior stumbles a little bit on removal, like how Chess Dude's hand was against the Shaman, it will get severely punished. Yep, and as TJ once told me, Mana Worm is the key that unlocks the door to Mage Paradise. It's it's a pretty good card. If there's no Fiery War to answer it, you kind of have to set up a way to kill it over two turns. So I'd really like to see that the slam come out here by Chess Dude, just setting up for the Ravaging Ghoul the following turn, so you can make quick work of it before it eats you alive. Yeah, I'm curious if there are alternatives here as well, though. Chess Dude does have an option to just Hero Power and then roll into Bash and then try to use Revenge and Ravaging Ghoul to maybe clear out okay. the common two health minions from this matchup. But does opt to go for the uh, slam here and set up on this Mana Worm for the Ravaging Ghoul. Of course, development, very important in, in pretty much any matchup. Yeah. And Ravaging Ghoul is a tough one to use in this one in particular. Yeah, typically speaking, you use it to combo with any sort of three damage effects, such as Fiery Warx or Bash, to help you kill uh, Flame Waker. That's normally the problem one for Warrior, because Warrior's really good at doing one damage. They're not so great at dealing four, and they're pretty good at dealing three. So that, that's usually where things come into trouble. Yeah, this is... This is the kind of turn I think Chess Dude was really hoping Neobility didn't have. You know, Sorcerer's Apprentice would still be a threat here to the Ravaging Ghoul, but the Cult Sorcerer is a very different kind of threat. Yeah, it activates the Arcane Blast to be able to kill the, the Ravaging Ghoul for just one mana and allow your opponent to, you know, continue developing two mana creatures behind it. So oftentimes really scary just to develop into spell power from a uh, Temple Mage. Now that does give him a two for one. Uh, with the Ravaging Ghoul, the Slam did replace itself, but it's a sure. lot of mana to be expending to get that extra card. So far, Neobility will have expended one mana for the Mana Worm and will have ex expended one more for the Arcane Blast in that situation. So choosing to use the Bash here, I think is very wise of Chess Dude, not opening up the possibility of the board really snowballing in Neobility's favor by playing the Ravaging Ghoul is a pretty heads up play. The only thing that's scary about the play is now you leave yourself with no great way to kill a Flame Waker. And if a Flame Waker comes down, it, it could be lights out. But you're, you expect th to be drawing into Shield Slams, Executes, weapons, things that can beat Flame Waker in now the future. Now that being said, so. can he afford to not Shield Slam this Acolyte here? That is representing three draws for Neobility right now. Ugh, can you afford two? Shield slam it though at the same time. Yeah. Like oh. it, that shield slam is like one of your best removal spells in your entire deck. So using it on an accolade of pain feels horrible. It's it's used to deny two draws is what it would be used for. Picture counter spell onto an arcane intellect. Are you okay with that? Well, it's not exactly translated in that though because the ability has to spend mana to get those cards. So he still has to pay the cost of you know, an Arcane Intellect twice over because he pays three mana for the Acolyte, which is a lost in tempo, and then he pays, you know, two mana each time he pings it. And uh, it's, this, is a, this is a hard situation. This is, once again, Chess Dude has found himself in a very critical spot where he will choose to build board tension with his own Acolyte of Pain, it looks like. And this could start the snowball here Whoa. for Neobility. Wow, he will you shield some a Mana Worm? I don't like this play at all. I think the Mana Worm's essentially dead as a one health creature. You have two Whirlwind effects in your hand. The Mana Worm's not doing anything threatening. I guess he's trying to protect his Acolyte, but protecting your Acolyte in this situation seems very hard to do as 
you know, Tempo Mage, and especially the version the ability's playing, plays almost nothing but burn slash removal. I, I feel like if this was going to be the game plan, that Shield Slamming the Acolyte is superior. The Man yeah, Worm is not representing a significant threat right now. It's, it's the most it's going to deal is about three to four damage in a yeah. single turn. And then you just revenge in its debt. Or Ravaging Goal. Or Ravaging Goal, you have options. Now I, instead, Neo Ability's drawn an extra card. Chestu doesn't have the Shield Slam. Yeah. And now the Arcane Blast tempo's happened. And now you have Whirlwind effects in your hand against an Acolyte. So now you're forced to take a bit of an awkward turn. He's going to give up draws in favor okay. of extra health. So I think Chestu's plan here overall is to try to keep Neo Ability restricted on options as long as possible in terms of board development. I don't think that the, that having a lot of cards in Neo Ability's hand is really a major concern for him right now. It feels like he's moving towards Sylvanas, towards Gorhal, and just trying to find a major swing turn at some point. Well, it's going to be an awkward road till he gets to that major swing turn because now uh, Neo Ability has developed this Azur Drake, and if uh, Chestu tries to remove the Azur no Drake by using his Fiery War Axe and a Whirlwind effect, he's going to be feeding the ability basically an extra draw. Yep, Sylvanas does act as a as a taunt minion in this spot, and a taunt that can't be targeted to that matter because Neo ability will not be in the business of handing Chestu to one of his minions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this it, is this is a really rough spot for him. I mean, he does have a high life total, but Neo Ability's game plan is more about critical mass than it is about sheer aggression. Yeah, eventually the Tempo Mage deck oftentimes just gets enough burn to make it happen. With the torches each being nine damage, the fireballs each being six damage, frostbolts each being three damage. You can expect some amount of damage off Cabal's Tome. You have Ragnaros. It's so much damage from the deck if you give it time and you do take some chip damage from the minions. So. And it's starting to mount now. I mean, yeah. now there's Arcane Missiles. As soon as he finds Flame Waker, that can be better unlocked, even in combination with Mana Worm. It's totally fine. He's got more card draw options. Mm -hmm. The Sylvanas is getting answered this turn. Yeah, it, was just, it had to be just plain defensively, just because Chestu's so far behind. He just had to throw it away, basically. And that's never a good feeling. That's not what the, you want from the card in general. So there's, there's Flame Waker. Yeah, he hasn't even played a Flame Waker yet. Like, New Ability is pretty far ahead kind of dominating the match without yet having even played a Flame Waker. Yeah, this Gorehal, I think, though, this is what I think Chess Dude is really relying on, is the Gorehal pulling a lot of weight in this matchup. If you keep your life total high, it means that you can expend more of it in the Gorehal later on. But the problem with that is the build from the ability. The end it's game, damage. The end game has a Firelands portal. There's a Cabalist Tome. There's a Ragnaros in here. Mm -hmm. He got two draws off the Acolyte. You still have to worry about Flame Waker pressure. The Forgotten Torches are going to add more burn to the deck. There's a lot of angles of attack from Neo Ability, and I'm not sure Chess Dude is, is, is able to check them all right now. Yeah, that is a lot of burn damage coming in. Look at that one mana deal five from the Arcane Missiles. Flame Waker was basically used in this situation as a deal four spell, and if it gets eaten by the Gore Howl, then Flame Waker dealt six damage to face to Chess Dude. Three mana deal six damage. That sounds like a sounds like a card that the ability just added to his deck as well. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. So strong. And Chess Dude doesn't have hand. good ways to respond. What? I mean, what does what he do? Is Harrison armor up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's what he has to do. As bad as that sounds, and then New Ability basically has a 50-50 flip to just win the game with a Ragnaros on turn eight, and then the way he lined up these burn spells is then turn nine, he has Firelands Portal for Frostbolt. And, he, and we're not even to the Cabalist Tome yet. No, we're no, not even at the stage where the extra is fuel. Yeah, yeah. So he's got turn eight Ragnaros, and then the way he positioned to the curve, Firelands Portal Frostbolt face. Let's, so. let's go ahead and pile some more damage on top. Yeah, this curve's just working out perfectly for Neo Ability. He's basically set up a three-turn lethal here with uh, those burn spells in his hand. Unfortunately for him, it hits the Harrison the Jones, Harrison Jones yep. so he's unable to get that eight damage in there. And I think this is the kind of territory that Chess Dude's looking for, which is be able to start digging, offsetting the threats, and then finding something. But a second revenge is not what he's looking for right now. No. And not only that, but it's really interesting to note, Chess Dude's at 13. Yeah. Neo Ability didn't set him below 13, so Revenge is not active for three damage yet. It is currently only one, and that's a big deal when you're talking about Azure Drake's hitting the board. It, it really, really is. And here we see, uh, most likely, I think, the Firelands portal, but he could go with Azure Drake Frostbolt. Azure Drake Frostbolt. Sorcerer's Apprentice. Yep. Yeah. Squeezing the missiles as well. And suddenly the Gorehal is now shut off, so Chest Dude 
Now without the option. Oh, no, oh, yeah, yeah, Missiles. Yeah. That's Plays very intelligent. The, yep, yep. Play around the revenge. I like <gasps> it. I mean, the hand is useless right now. The hand is really bad, actually. Yeah. Baron Geddon's not getting played. Mm -hmm. Execute. There's not a high profile execute in this target other than other than the sec other than Ragnaros or whatever comes out of Firelands Portal. Yeah. I think this is Deathwing and try to kill Neobility in three turns. I, I do as well. I think 100% Deathwing here is the best play just because of what's been expended. You said there's no execute targets left besides Firelands Portal minion, which is, you know, a five drop. So really not the greatest execute target in the world. You're not pitching any armor gain. Revenge has been played around by Neobility, Neobility a lot, and you can expect him to continue doing so, making it very difficult to play. Baron Geddon kills you, so that's not a productive <laughs> option. So I think 100% Deathwing. We will be one more turn of waiting for Chess Dude, it looks like, as he will opt for Revenge and Ravaging Ghoul to wipe out the Sorcerer's Apprentice and try to use his resources in the best way possible. So trying to get one extra minion out of this Deathwing as well as one extra life effectively once he sees the hero power from Neobility. But Neobility's not slowing down. It's damage, damage, damage. Yeah, and it looks like it is going to be Chess Dude is going to be rewarded by this line of play because a lot of times here he just gets Neobility's Firelands Portal minion, and that's the final remaining threat in the deck. Yeah, that is a big deal. What, that patience, I think, is intended to snag an extra threat here. Mm -hmm. And Neobility is kind of thinking over playing this Firelands Portal because of the hesitation that Chess Dude had last turn, and we saw Chess Dude moused over the Deathwing a, a few times. So Neobility might be afraid of that potentially being Deathwing and might try and play around it. Wow. That's, that's a pretty good one to get. Doesn't draw a card, but still not too bad. And we'll opt to take his extra damage. If he plays Deathwing, yep. now that he is dead. <laughs> the Azure Drake actually effectively produced an extra mana here. Yeah. With the spell damage, making up for the loss of Fire Blast. So I was able to help guarantee that damage. Yeah, that is, and that is dead. Chess Dude does not have a way to live through this, I don't think. No, he's going to try. He's going to try and figure out the best play here just in case there isn't a fireball from Neobility's side. Neobility has two fireballs in the deck and uh, a Roaring Torch in the deck, so three cards that are potentially game-winning for him here. Cabalist Tome can generate, Arcane Intellect can generate, and uh, he's got another Azure Drake in the deck that can generate. So he's got a lot of outs for potential lethal here. and uh, With no way to play around them, it's, it's time to giddy up. You can tell he doesn't want to do it. The thing about it is Chess Dude is so used to having plays that will keep him in control mm -hmm. that when he has a play that doesn't really yield him control, it is just sort of his highest potential win rate, you can tell how uncomfortable it makes him. Yeah, he, he really does not like throwing caution to the wind at all. He's very calculated. So, Wow. But, I mean, if you put Deathwing in your deck, Usually you put it in there because you're going to play it. Yeah, it's actually even going to deter him from doing that as well. I mean, playing it this way and armoring up does actually not play around any of the six damage spells. And Deathwing doesn't kill you to Frostbolt. So this this play just kind of, the you know, the most he could do really. I mean, there's nothing here that was going to save him in this spot. Neobility picks up another Fireball in case he didn't have enough. Yeah. And takes a 3-2 lead in the series. That Tempo Mage did so much work to that control warrior. Yeah, and that's why I said, like, his lineup looking at it is very soft counter on Warrior. All of the decks are slightly favored against Warrior. Tempo Mage isn't insane against Warrior by any means, but the way that he has it teched out, the different kind of cards he put in there, the the, the burn-oriented build, the kind of Druid-esque style of Tempo Mage is uh, very effective against Control Warrior. It was 2-0 for Chestu, but now it's three straight for Neobility. Can he wrap this series up, or will Chestu turn it back around? Stay tuned. We'll be back right after this. The next game, or up to three of them, or up to two of them, rather, will determine who is moving on to the semifinals and keeping their dreams of BlizzCon alive. For the other, it will come to an end in this series. Three straight wins for Neobility. Chess Dude, he's got to be under some heat here. Yeah, he's feeling a lot of pain. Kept queuing up with the Warrior, and the Warrior keeps getting smacked down by Neobility. So you may see him probably just give up on the Warrior for a minute, take a break from it, and try the <laughs> Druid out for a spin. But even if he does that, then he's stuck with the Druid Mirror. So at worst, Neobility has a 50-50 matchup plus another game. Now, what's the kind of the difference between the Druid decks? Because we saw in Chess Dudes, he's got Yogg-Saron, no Violet Teachers. Neobility has Violet Teachers. How does it? Well, we'll get to that perhaps in another game. It's going to be Warrior again versus Neobility on Druid. And just over the break, you were telling me Neobility does not lose with Druid. Yeah, Neobility used to be known as kind of like a Druid god, a Druid ladder god. For all of 2015 and 2014, he was 
very consistently top 10 or top 5 legend with Druid, and he pretty much exclusively played Druid on ladder for a really long time, and since then has kind of lost that reputation as the best Druid player ever because he's kind of branched out and started learning other classes and started competing competitively now. But, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a force to be reckoned with when it comes on Druid. Now, that hand, on the other hand, is not a force to be reckoned no. with. That is the old Arcane Giant Malagos opener, and Wild Growth is a card that's incredibly important to this matchup. Mm -hmm. Just getting out to, to a, a quick start, getting your mana accelerated, obviously, is very good. But in that same vein, Nourish is absolutely insane as well, just because of how much value it produces per card. Because at the end of the day, if you can outvalue the control warrior opponent, you win the game. And the token variants of Druid actually have the ability to just outvalue their opponent. Very much so. It's a little bit harder versus Warrior, but if he's able to force some premier removal spells on non-Arcane Giant, non-Ragnaros, non-Malagos targets, that is certainly a winning situation for Neobility. Yeah. Even if his hand right now is not the strongest. Yeah, if you, if you really just break it down and look at it and look at the amount of threats Druid has, because it's actually crazy. They have two Arcane Giants, the Malagos and the Ragnaros that all require a premier removal spell. They all require an Executor or a Shield Slam, basically. And if your opponent is forced into a situation where they have to execute or shield slam, say, an Emperor Thorasan or a Violet Teacher, then all of a sudden, one of those goes unchecked, almost guaranteed. That's a big deal. Yeah. It's a very big deal. Neo ability doesn't strike me as a 2-2 kind of guy. No, no. You, you almost always go for the, <laughs> the the gaining mana off the Mire Keeper. There are very niche situations where you can produce a 2-2. Other than that, it happens at, like, turn 9 or 10. Even at turn nine, I'd, get, I'd take the mana. That belongs in a museum. Okay. You're going to want that mana. Sure. Sometimes it helps you wild growth that turn. Yeah. yeah very rare occasions <laughs> it can work its way in There's there. also the opposite of it, where there are situations where you, where you would normally take the 2-2 two -two and very rarely take it as a result of that. Emperor Thorson joins the hand for Neobility, but it has been uh, a preface of Harrison Jones from Chess Dude, who is very much thinking about that card, I believe. Yeah, Harrison Jones has perfect stat line for contesting the Emperor Thorsen. Can just kind of trade in with it very, very nicely, get it removed. And even if there is, um, like, the Harrison Jones removed somehow, then uh, Chess Dude still has great ways to answer it in his hand with the bash, with the execute if he wants to take it. But New Ability just feels like he wants to get his hand reduced so that he can make some big Violet Teacher plays, and I don't blame him for that. Yeah, not at all. He has no option for clearing the Emperor Thorson. I'm sorry, for clearing the Harrison Jones right now. And so if the best way to do that is pay six mana, discount five of the cards in your hand to deal with a 5-4, that's not a bad card. Yeah, it's trades pretty nicely. And Ooh. One of the important things about that Emperor Thorsan discount is that it is able to discount the Malagos and a Living Roots. So that is going to make it so that the burst damage out of hand for Neobility is going to be live. Well, Mulch gets picked up, but won't be used this turn. Obviously, Neobility would like to uh, have that in reserve for more of the Gromish Hellscream or Deathwing sort of targets. But with Chestude getting a Violet Teacher of his own, it's kind of an interesting spot. I don't think you're too afraid of a warrior having a Violet Teacher. They don't have that many great ways to generate 1-1s. One so, and they don't really have any buffs in the deck at all to capitalize off them. So you have to imagine the one ones are just going to die to swipe later on. I definitely don't think it's worth Neobility blowing his huge damage combo. You see, he's already got the Moonfire, he's already got the Living Roots and the Malagos, and a Nourish to search for the rest of that combo. But just with uh, those three cards alone in his hand, that's already 13 damage. Yeah, Chess Dude doesn't look like he's slated for one ones anytime soon as Bloodhoof Brave joins the fray. Bloodhoof Brave actually a surprisingly strong in this particular situation. Yeah, it's just a, it's a good pile of stats. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Druid sometimes can struggle with just a good pile of stats. You might want to even consider throwing it out there this turn with maybe a tempo execute could make something happen or just taking the trades on with the Violet Teachers. I think I like just the, the Violet Teacher straight up. Play the Blood Hoof Brave, whack the Violet Teacher into the opposing one, use Fiery War Axe, clean it up. And then you have a second Fiery War Axe yeah, did you can just Ready equip to go. this yeah. turn? You can either equip it or you can think about just armoring up this turn. Yep, doesn't have to worry about Harrison Jones from Neability's side. He's not found in the build. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's in a pretty good spot, honestly. And just 
the fact that you're able to just answer your opponent's Violet Teacher with a minion as a Control Warrior is pretty huge. Usually you have to expend removal to do so. Yeah, he's opting to go for the Fiery Wags this turn as well, largely in part for the development in the future. Ravaging Ghoul oftentimes will be slated with a Bloodhoof Brave on board, uh, especially in this matchup, and he can combine that with Acolyte of Pain, so that would take away the ability to add Fiery War Axe should he need it. So uh, favoring the development here over the extra life, which in some of the other matchups, we've seen him kind of favoring the extra life at times. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I like that. I like that a lot. It can be oftentimes quite difficult to get the Acolyte plus Ravaging Ghoul combo off because you're under a lot of pressure a lot of the times. And you're going to see him get rewarded for it here as he's able to now go Acolyte, Ravaging Ghoul, and kill the... Uh, Azure Drake with his weapon. Yep, an Arcane Giant. Only two spells have been played so far for Neo Ability that will quickly change as we're approaching these wild growth turns. Yeah, those are each two spells once uh, Neo Ability gets to 10 mana. So uh, that'll be four additional spells played for only four mana in total, reducing the cost of the Arcane Giant quite dramatically. I was kind of surprised it actually took as long to ramp to Arcane Giant as it did. Yeah. It felt like it would happen sooner, but it's usually about turn 10. Yeah, it usually, especially in this matchup where the Druid oftentimes is really slow playing, always drawing off Nourish rather than ramping off Nourish, and honestly tries to just out-card slash out-threat their opponent in this matchup. Yep, and this spot is it's about to get tough. Chess Dude has a magnificent turn in front of him, mm -hmm. drawing extra cards, dealing lots of damage, and killing lots of minions. This is about as good as it gets. Yeah, we may even see him trade in maybe the Violet Teacher to try and play around a potential swipe from his opponent, save a little bit of life, retain armor, which is really good. Does, does it play around swipe, though? I mean, Acolyte of Pain is on board right now. I think you're encouraging swipe. I think the, the larger concern would be the life total, actually. Well, it's the armor total, not really the life. But yeah, just because in case he draws a, a shield slam, if he's only got, you know, zero armor, <laughs> then it's, a, it's not a very good card. <laughs> but when you have five armor, suddenly it's... Uh, it's a very magical card. Speak of the devil. Yeah. It's that, it's that caster precognition. He may even still be swiping here, even though it's not as good. You may see a mulch come out instead, though. Mulch, typically speaking, you'd want to try and save it for Deathwing if you can, but uh, a lot of times that's really hard to do as it is such a great tempo card. Yeah, honestly, Bloodhoof Brave is a pretty solid mulch target for the most part. The problem is he's aware of Deathwing being in Chess Dude's deck. And so at that point, Mulch doesn't look quite as appealing. And so you're kind of relegated to taking five damage in a lot of those situations. Yeah, he might even just value five damage not very highly from the warrior side. Like he, 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 maybe New Ability just thinks, I don't care if the warrior deals me five damage. The, the most they have is Grom. And other than that, if I kill it the next turn, no minion really connects with my face. So what do I care about taking damage as long as I have the mulch to deal with Deathwing? So, so I have a question for you here as Chess Dude just blisters through his turn, which will be armor up and pass and attack. <laughs> How important is Malagos to the finishing blow for this deck? Because right now, Neo Ability does have the option to Malagos swipe for a full board clear, nine damage, and then can pick up seven more with the Living Roots. Does he need more mileage than that from, from the Malagos? It depends what you can get off your Raven Idols, really. A lot of the times, it is okay, but uh, sometimes if your Raven Idols are really weak, it's very difficult to outvalue your opponent. But we do see him cash it in here. This is not only going to do a boatload of damage, it is going to clear the board, and it is going to reduce the cost of the Arcane Giant dramatically. That is another benefit of this, and he's pretty much pushed all the damage that was needed from Malagos. I mean, there's only two other spells in the deck that he could couple with it at this point. So I think having the threat out, forcing Chestu to have execute in a spot like this, then also ramping the Arcane Giant, maybe it's about as good as he gets. I think he fell too far behind because of the pressure. And you can see, even from the control side, pressure matters. Yeah. And in this spot, Chestu forced plays from Neo Ability that he did not want to make. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And... Uh... Yeah, got a, a ton of damage in there, and we can most likely see him just kind of develop one big singular threat, or he might even just go with both Arcane Giants here. Well, that that those couple draws were are very dangerous for Chess Dude now. It's We're looking at Arcane Giant, and now here's a, a curious thing. Do you ever develop multiple Arcane Giants in this spot, or do you want to kind of go threat by threat to eliminate the possibility of Brawl just becoming an effective deadly shot at that time? Well... If you develop both, then your opponent's like effective turn has to be 
Brawl, Execute, Activate, or Execute, because uh, Shield Slam doesn't cut it in this instance. So I, I think if you, you're making your opponent have three cards, which is difficult for them to do, and at the same time, they're not even getting that great of mileage out of them. Yeah, Brawl, Brawl dealing eight damage for five mana, it's not unreasonable, but Flame Lance certainly isn't a card I've seen in a Mage deck mm -hmm. and anytime it, recently. It's against a Violet Teacher deck. You want those Brawls to clean up Violet Teacher exactly. boards. So, uh, now, that ability. being said, being, at, tw being be at 12 or below also helps improve that as well, though, uh, with answering sure. Violet Teachers with Revenge. That's that's a, a glimpse of the bright side for Chess Dude in that spot. Well, the, the biggest downside, though, is it's your whole turn. And if that's your whole turn, uh, look what's in the ability's hand to yep. follow this up that also requires another single target removal. Yep, it's Big Papa Rag. Yeah, and you're running out of single target removal now. And that's exactly what you were alluding to prior yeah. to this, was that if all these top-end minions require a premier removal spell, Chess Dude will run out. And Brawl acting as one of those... Not quite the situation that I think Chess Dude envisioned himself in. We'll go ahead and swing with the Fiery War Axe. Yep. And I'm curious what that swing is all about. Well, let's see. Oh, how I see exactly what he's doing. He wants to draw Gorhal, get Gorhal set, and then have lethal with it afterwards with Grom. So he's yeah. setting up a lethal with, with cards that he hasn't actually drawn yet, mm -hmm. and it's trying to play to his outs. You know, Chess Dude, he's such a big picture kind of guy. Yeah. I mean, to give you an idea, Chess Dude won the national championships in the 15 and 16 age bracket when he was playing chess. Yeah, he's definitely a guy that understands thinking ahead, and that's why we can see him setting up for that gore howl lethal potentially a little bit down the line. And new ability is going to try and not let him have any time to do any sort of fancy tricks here. He's given him the business, and uh, this Ragnaros plays around Shield Slam quite efficiently because knocking off all of the armor and both executes have been played, it's very difficult for Chess 2 to remove this. He may just need to use the Grom. Wow. He could ignore it and just play the Sylvanas. Wow. That's an interesting top deck. This is crazy. I mean, giving him the business is usually a 15-yard penalty, but here, the rules are off. I mean, this is this is dire straits for Chess 2, and his tournament life is on the line right now. If he's going to make it to BlizzCon, he's got to get past this game. And and look at the board. Yeah, yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be very tough to beat. If he does go with the Sylvanas line of play, then the ability has the ability to make a bunch of tokens with Violet Teacher, then Mulch and Hero Power Face, and just uh, kill Chess Dude with Rag a large majority of the time. Or if Chess Dude decides to go with the Grom Revenge play and just trade off his Grom, it's gonna be a lot harder for him to close out this game. It would be reliant solely on Deathwing at that point, almost. Yeah. And that's the line he is going to take. He's just he's just weighing that uh, Sylvanas most likely is going to get not a great outcome for him. Chess dude cannot feel good about that. I mean, it's here's the deal. At this point, just minions are a threat. It doesn't matter what they are. Any minions are going to be a threat. Yep. Neobility is going to go for Raven, Idol, Fandral. This in is this spot. huge and in this matchup because you get the minion and the spell off of it, so you're able to just generate more value and you're just going to outvalue the druid. There's a lot of situations. Oh, that's actually that's lethal because he picked yeah. up the claw with, with Innervate. Claw. That's going to do it. Neobility is going to wrap up the set and a fist pump for him as he closes this one out. Wow. Yeah, you don't, you don't beat Neobility at druid. That is... <laughs> I said the same thing about Muzzy earlier. He's another ladder player that just loves queuing that Druid, but it, the ability is like Muzzy's dad in this instance, <laughs> as far as that goes. He's just one of the greatest Druid players I have ever had the pleasure to watch. And, and that was not a, a super strong opening hand from the ability. Yeah. This was this was Meyer Keeper into just Nourish, and then kind just of kind nothing. Of slow played a value game from there, and then chained threats one after another, forcing lots of single target removal. And Malagos was such a big catalyst yeah. to that. Getting the Emperor Thoris on to contest a, a Harrison Jones yeah. enabled the Malagos board sweep later on that he used. Yeah, there's such a, a, a weird line of play when you look at it, because usually you never want to develop an Emperor Thoris and into a, a 5-4. That seems terrible, but that's really one of the plays where he, that was like, yeah, this is the time where I have to do this, and that'll set up for everything later on down the line and really kind of smooth things out and made it work for him. Yep, let's throw it over to the analyst desk to get a word a little bit deeper into this match.